Welcome everyone, thank you very much for turning up this evening and I hope it is uh, enjoyable. Uh, we're going to be talking about turning science into stories. How do you get people to care about climate change? Uh, so let's start. Uh, let's start on a depressing note and, and work up. Um, so who in the audience has heard about fake news? Can we just have a hands show? Okay, brilliant. Um, so fake news, uh, this trend of deliberate misinformation, of hoaxes, of exaggerated or even invented facts uh, in print, broadcasting, social media, and it's designed to mislead for political or financial gain. It's, uh, it's not satire, it's designed to manipulate people and to get certain outcomes. Now this came to global attention during the, uh, the US media campaign and the sorry, US presiden presidential campaign and since then it's actually been, been growing in strength. Um, now part of this is due to what we're seeing, we're seeing this increasing polarisation between the left and the right and the political spectrum which is accredited for part of this fake news epidemic and we're also seeing the rise of anonymous publishing. So you can publish what you want on the media via blogging um, and you c there is le very little accountability for that. It's very difficult to liable or slander um, because the accountability is less. Now, the next step of this fake news epidemic is now Donald Trump, uh, most notably, is now attacking news outlets he doesn't like. CNN, BBC, New York Times, for example, and branding it as fake news. Now, this has led to some <coughs> academics proposing that Trump has defeated journalism. Uh, one of the points of journalism is there to hold public figures, politicians, business leaders to account, to fact check their information and to expose when they are telling lies. Um, but we are seeing that now people like him are becoming immune to this. No matter what you publish, you <coughs> can't change people's opinion of this. And this is very, very dangerous. Um, we've had fake news <coughs> throughout history, um, interestingly. And one of the first examples of fake news was the 1853 moon hoax, um, in which a New York paper, The Sun, um, published this story about Dr. Grant, who is a made-up uh, astronomer, looking through the world's <laughs> most powerful telescope at the time to see bat people on the moon. Um, and it was designed to increase readership of the paper so we can see economic gain. Um, so, you know, we ha always have had fake news of some sort throughout history. We've seen it in propaganda through wars to try and galvanise the population against the enemy. But what we are seeing now is a new type of fake news. We are seeing it increase on a global <laughs> scale, and I think that's attributed to, to social media and the power of um, viral news, how fast you can get news out there, is really, really changing the landscape on this. Um, now, I want to also mention something within the fake news world of alternative facts. Um, you might be familiar with this if you've, again, followed the presidential campaign. Um, the largest audience ever to witness a presidential inauguration, period, as an American thing, isn't it? both in person and around the world. Now, this was the White House Pre Press Secretary, Sean Spicer. Um, you can see the photos left and right here. Let's compare 2017, Trump inauguration, to Obama's. We can quite clearly, to most people, see that it's not the largest at all. Um, but then a presidential advisor, Kellyanne Conway, said, you're overreacting to this when a news journalist challenged her about this lie and she said our press secretary was presenting alternative facts. Now, <laughs> that's a lie to me, um, but interestingly, there's very little reprimand for saying things like this. Once again, we are seeing how certain figures are immune to it, uh, which is very, very interesting and a point which I want to 
to comment on. <coughs> Finally, the final sort of um, thing I want to mention in this introduction is post-truth as a concept. <coughs> Post-truth was the word of the year by Oxford Dic Dictionaries last year, and it means situations in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So emotion and personal belief um, above logical argument and facts. In the UK, we had our own shape on this uh, with the notorious Brexit bus and we can see some of the appeals to emotion which were used in this campaign. Slogans such as take control and taking back control, these very emotive ideas of reclaiming something which is lost. Um, and once again, there was very little backlash for what I would call the blatant lie um, emblazoned across that bus. Um, because it, it, it tweak, it sort of it, the campaign itself used a lot of these emotive things. Um, so all of this together, packaging all this together, <coughs> we're seeing a time when truth and facts themselves are under attack. Um, the very foundations of science, of rational and logical argument are perhaps crumbling. So my question is how do we communicate climate change and the rationale for sustainability within this fake news post-truth landscape now that's what i want to talk to you about tonight just a very brief introduction to me um, i started my work in 2005 uh, when i was 13 years old and i got involved um, when my family and I, my, my parents at the back of the room, hello, um, when my parents <laughs> and I were stuck, when we were trapped in some of the worst floods on record to hit North Yorkshire, um, where we lived just on the, on the other side of the Pennines. And it was being involved in those storms and listening to a climate scientist saying that events like these would increase in frequency and severity because of climate change, which really sort of sparked my attention and got me interested in this. And since then, I've helped to get climate change on the UK school curriculum with the Prime Minister. I've done free TED Talks, I blog for the Huffington Post, I'm on various panels of the United Nations um, advising how to communicate climate change. Uh, and in my day-to-day -day role, um, I now get involved in consultancy, uh, sustainability consultancy to business leaders and political leaders about how to implement the Paris Agreement. Um, so I'm hoping to share some of my experiences tonight about um, all those years which I've been, been doing this. Uh, so right, let's, let's get on with the actual content of the lecture. Um, these are the two messages which I want to focus on tonight. The first being why should we bother engaging with people who don't agree with us? Um, it's always very challenging and always very difficult. And a lot of you might feel, especially in rooms like this, when you're having conversations with people who are like you, that we're already there with climate change. Um, again, this happens very much in social media, in what sort of I call echo chambers, um, where we get our own personal views reflected back to us. So it seems that the world is sort of all in agreement, um, that we are moving far with sustainability and that everyone is agreeing with our point of view. Um, and I want to explore that first. And the second part is I want to look at core beliefs and storytelling and how can that help us in our communication of climate change and sustainability. OK, so let's, let's start on the first one of those. Why should I bother engaging people who don't agree with me? Um, so here we are, 2017. We've got this us and them dichotomy. And we are seeing so many people now, pretty much all credible politicians, celebrities, business leaders are amassing to be on <coughs> the good side of climate change. They are embracing sustainability. They are switched on to climate change action. And it's seeming like there's just this asshole on <laughs> the other side. 
Um, but let's uh, just think about this for a minute. It, it, it does seem this sort of Trump versus world narrative. And a lot of sustainability leaders, um, Al Gore, for example, and, and others, are of the perception that we should just ignore him, that we are moving in the right direction. There's already such a, a great momentum towards low carbon economies and, and uh, tackling climate change that you know, we should just ignore him and move on. Examples, you know, China leading the way, um, the Brazilian revolution in renewable energy, for example. We should just move on and ignore him. A lot of people don't want to talk to him, uh, talk about him, sorry. Now, I disagree with that because we have to remember that he isn't just one person. He represents a movement of people, a lot of people who are unhappy with the status quo, a lot of people who feel very disconnected from this progressive side which we're seeing. So I think it is very important to address what he stands for um, and actually to tackle this rather than ignoring. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this. Now, since I started my journey back in 2005, so many more people now know <coughs> and care about climate change. But that's irrefutable. But the problem we have now is that a lot of people don't care enough to do something significant, whether it to be to vote in a, in a certain way, change their business in a certain way, or, or whatever it may be. A lot of people don't care enough to do something. And then there are still those who, who simply don't care or don't see climate change as an important issue, um, especially in the very complicated and stressful world which we live in at the moment with the, with the geopolitics and <coughs> many, many other issues to deal with. Now, I want to tell you a, a quick story here. I, I did a lecture at Durham University last year. It was at the opening of an Antarctic exhibition. And there were two boxes in this exhibition, uh, which people could vote on with ping pong balls. So it was a little sort of straw poll of, of people. And one of the boxes said, climate change is an issue which affects me. <coughs> About 60% 60 people, 60 of people said it does. Now, 40% of people who visit an Antarctic exhibition, so not your sort of normal public demographic said that climate change is not an issue which is affecting me. Now, to me, that's quite worrying. Um, and the next box along was climate change is an issue which will affect future generations. And that wasn't horrendously, that wasn't that much better. Perhaps only about sort of 35%, um, obviously not a sort of um, indicative, you know, the most robust scientific study, but it was just something which sort of quite interested me. And if you look at um, broader polls and consensus, um, we do still have quite a lot of work to do uh, um, about raising public care in climate change. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about something, this concept about the losers of globalisation and who perhaps isn't switched on to this narrative. Um, now, this is something which is, is more focused upon um, the UK narrative uh, and the sort of the US narrative. So for our international visitors, I hope you can sort of draw some parallels with some issues you might be seeing in your uh, countries and communities. Um, now, I see a lot of people who feel that they are losing out from globalisation. Now, this was a narrative which it was used strongly by Marine Le Pen uh, in the French election, and we've seen it again in Brexit, and we've seen it in Trump, um, that people are experiencing a negative quality of life. They are seeing the global movement of people and finance as damaging their way of living. They're seeing jobs perhaps going. They're seeing um, inflation, outpricing their wage increase. Generally, they have a negative outlook on the world. They're not happy with where we are going to. Now, a lot of this is tied up in people trying to resist that, trying to look back to sort of protectionist ideas, trying to re-nationalise and close things down um, and resisting 
technological advancement and as part of that resisting the advancement in climate change um, and we see this very strongly in the US and Australia um, trying to revert back to coal um, very strong national coal economies but we're seeing this sort of anti-progressive voice because of these um, and these people are losing out from globalization and I think it's, it's very very interesting because for me the transition to a low carbon economy must leave no one behind um, we, it does offer the opportunity for a better quality of life but only if we do it properly and for me we need to engage with these people who are not seeing the benefits of low carbon living um, now is anyone familiar with this graph does anyone know what this is yes there are a few nods. Um, so this is the very famous Kubler-Ross um, five stages of grieving model um, in psychology. And Duffel and Bunzel have just written a book which incorporates this narrative into global governance and the sustainability space. And I think it's very, very interesting. Um, and they propose that we have lost sovereignty a long, long time ago because of the nature of global, globalization. There is an imperative to keep the nation state, um, the sort of the model that which we're familiar with today, which governs geopolitics, which started in the, sort of the, the Treaty of Westphalia, and um, the nation state model. It's fundamentally important to keep the nation state competitive. That must be at the heart of what every government does. And because of the way global business operates, that means that governments are subject to what businesses want. For example, lower and lower corporation tax, we see race to the bottom of workers' rights and social standards. And there's very little individual governments can do to tackle these problems. Um, and the idea is that governments are quite powerless in this situation and that we have indeed lost sovereignty and that we are somewhere on this on this journey um, a lot of people who are in the sort of the far right of the political spectrum are in this sort of denial and anger <coughs> space trying to move back and trying to regain sovereignty where a lot a lot of liberal and more progressive people are, are more in this sort of depressed space where we can't perhaps imagine what can break this deadlock. Now, I, I slightly deviated there, and I will sort of now flip back to what we were talking about, but I think it's quite important context because this inability for national governments to do something offers up a new, very exciting space of business. And this is my message, um, which is, uh, is the one I want to focus on. This new role for business involves being political actors. So we are now seeing companies, um, this is an example from Tiffany's here, we are now seeing businesses lobbying for political change which isn't in their immediate self-interest. So we've always seen businesses lobbying um, for change but we are now seeing a different framing. We are now seeing a different um, lobbying here um, such as Tiffany's trying to keep the US in the Paris Agreement. Um, we are seeing industry collaboration, which is very, very interesting. Companies putting aside their competition and looking at shared supply chains, trying to tackle sustainability as an industry unit. So, for example, a group of retailers who share supply chains, who get clothes from the same place, from the same cotton fields, perhaps, might work together in a collaborative sort of way, which is very, very interesting. And the final part, um, business as a very active voice for consumer change as well, trying to push consumer change. So a very, very interesting role for business at the moment. Um, and when I'm asked about COP22 and the, the Paris conference, I frequently tell people that I think the biggest success of that conference was not the Paris Agreement itself, but the unprecedented involvement and excitement of the business community 
so much interest from the business community in that conference um, and I see a lot of untapped potential in that space. Um, so if we just very quickly familiarise ourselves with the stage of sustainability, uh, some of you might be aware of this or you might cover this in the course, but just to very quickly um, run through this, um, I, I believe there are three stages of the sustainability journey which a business goes on. Um, compliance, right at the bottom. Doing what you have to do. Um, meeting regulation. Reporting on emissions, for example. Moving on to seeing sustainability and climate change as a risk, as a risk to business, as a risk to supply chains, for example, seeing what the impact of climate change could do to your supply chains. If you import your raw materials from a country which is going to be affected by climate change, um, it is very likely that climate change will affect the availability and supply of those, so your costs might be affected, seeing that as a risk. And also seeing it as an opportunity as well, an opportunity to save money, an opportunity to engage with your customers, an opportunity to improve PR, for example. So that's the second stage, looking at it as a risk <coughs> and opportunity. And the final and third stage is integration. Um, seeing sustainability as this yin and yang sort of understanding, completely integrating sustainability into your business. Um, so the seemingly opposite forces of profit and sustainability can be one. Uh, now Michael Porter started writing about this in 1990, but we're only just seeing progressive businesses actually get to this stage now. Um, and for an example on this, uh, I once again mentioned Patagonia, a uh, very, very interesting company. And we can see that in this third stage of the sustainability journey, um, it also includes advocacy, so it includes sort of inspiring and implementing solutions. And this is what I was talking about, collaboration. So at this third stage of sustainability, the business is really a leader. Um, they're really a leader in the space. So that's sort of the three stages of sustainability, which um, I want to go on. Um, now let's just have a little bit of a situation report of, of where we are now. Um, we are seeing a few of those businesses at the top end of that spectrum, at level three, the leaders coming through. Um, we are seeing them open sourcing methodology. We are seeing them displaying how sustainability can actually be profitable. But what we need is more momentum to keep it going. Um, and that's why we need to engage with people who aren't yet engaged in that journey. Now, I just want to show you um, a video, and you might recognise this and, and talk you through it. It's very, very interesting. So, this is our this is our sustainability leader here, standing out from the field, doing something a little bit weird. Everyone's looking on and thinking that's a bit odd. But very quickly, we see the first follower. Now, first follower is quite an underrated form of leadership. Um, you can see that the original pioneer has embraced this first follower as an equal. Um, they make it easy to follow. For in the sustainability world, this might be achieved by open sourcing a methodology, for example, showing how you've done that. And you can see that these two are now quite happy and perhaps drunk as someone said. <laughs> <laughs> now I think we're about in this stage of the sustainability world at the moment and very soon you see a third person come into play. Um, now I think we're in this sort of stage at the moment. We've got a very core and active people, a very enthusiastic group of pioneers. But what we need to do is we need to bring that next wave of people forward. And now you can see there was quite a long break there before this next group of people came in. Now that's what we need to do. We need to get this next group of people in. Now, if you're watching carefully, you'll actually saw that when that fourth and fifth and sixth person came in, they came in as a bit of a wave. Um, 
and you can see groups of people now being attracted to this movement and we can achieve that catalytic effect by targeting certain individuals, certain perhaps managers in strategic positions to try and get a broader group of people on board. And very quickly you can see how this movement is formed um, and soon it becomes more weird not to be in it. Um, very, very interesting video, I think. Um, so this is a bit of a graph about what we sort of saw in this. We've got the innovators, we've got the lawn dancing man doing something a bit different, a little bit weird. And then we've got the early adopters who come in and help the movement pick up. Now, I think we're on this part of a sustainability journey at the moment and we need more momentum to get over this chasm, which is why I think we need to include a broader demographic of people in this. The people I mentioned, the losers of globalisation, I don't think we can do this without getting some of them on board into this, which is why I think it's very important to communicate with people who are outside of this room, people who wouldn't come to a climate change lecture on their Tuesday evening. Um, and I think that's very, very important. And in order to do this, we need to be smarter about how we <coughs> communicate climate change, especially in this era of post-truth politics and fake news. So this leads me on to my second part here. Uh, now we're going to look at core beliefs and storytelling. And hopefully I, I can impart some ideas uh, which you might want to use in your, in your own communication to friends or co-workers or clients or, or whoever. Um, so let's start with round one of facts. Um, as mentioned earlier in the lecture, the first episode of fake news, one of the first episodes of fake news, 1853, uh, the, the Great Moon Hoax by The Sun newspaper in New York. Second fact, more people are killed each year taking selfies than by sharks. Fact number three, in the original script of Star Wars by George Lucas, Yoda was called Buffy. <laughs> now, hopefully you find these facts quite interesting and when these topics next come up in conversation at a party, you might impart your newfound wisdom to your, to your fellow party goers. Let's try a second round of facts. Isaac Newton, a bit of a sort of national treasure in the UK, um, with his gravity discovery. Isaac Newton was a major investor in the slave trade. Charles Darwin frequently ate exotic animals, including puma, wild tortoise, sorry, the giant tortoise of the Galapagos, and many, many other endangered and now extinct animals. And more controversial, depending on your political views here or not, um, Margaret Thatcher was one of the first politicians to raise awareness of global warming in her 1989 address. Now, depending on your core values and your political beliefs, you might register different on this sort of emotional barometer. Um, but hopefully most of you felt a little bit differently receiving the second round of facts to the first ones. Perhaps you felt a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps even angry, based on your core beliefs. Now, we're going to explore a little bit more about core beliefs and how they affect us and how we can use them um, with help from the oatmeal, um, which is a very interesting uh, cartoon website, which I can direct to you if you're interested in learning a bit more. <coughs> so the question is here is why do we soften to some ideas, but we fiercely resist others? Now, a lot of people, when presented with the second round of facts, for example, uh, perhaps not in this environment, but in a one-to-one -one conversation, 
quite strongly resist things like that. They look for evidence to disprove. And a lot of people actually sort of dig their heels in and believe even stronger in the opposing argument, um, which is very, very interesting. Now, why does this happen? And why doesn't my clicker work? <laughs> there we go. Um, it's called the backfire effect. It's quite a well-known psychological behaviour. So the response to a physical threat is actually the same part of the brain which responds to an intellectual one. It's called the amygdala. Um, and there's a study done by the University of California which they put <coughs> people in an MRI machine and they played them facts which were counter to their political beliefs, um, for disproving the existence of God, for example, um, talking about how gay marriage should be widespread, and they monitored what happened in their brain, and they found out that the mind can't easily separate the emotional and logical cortex, and they found that the amygdala the same part of the brain that responds to the physical threat also responds to an emotional threat as well. So, <coughs> core beliefs. Core beliefs are the beliefs which people cherish most deeply. Um, they normally develop in childhood and they're compounded by life experiences. They're rigid, inflexible and very sensitive to being challenged. A core belief, for example, is belief in God or higher power. Um, a belief, um, for me, it could be a core belief for other people, um, is that cats are better pets than dogs. Um, core beliefs link quite strongly to core values as well, and we can talk about them in the same sort of way, but belief is more about um, these these uh, belief sort of things like this, whereas values is more something like equality or fairness. Um, but you can see that they, that they link together. Now, we construct all these core beliefs, we put them together, um, which makes a world view. And this world view is built how you build a house, um, with all of these constituent parts, religion, tradition, life experience, family, for example. And the brain absolutely loves consistency. It really loves the consistency. Now, what happens if a new piece is introduced and it doesn't fit? The whole house falls apart. Now, in order to stop that, the brain protects your worldview by strongly rejecting that piece. And then it builds a fence and moat around and refuses to let any more visitors in. Um, but the idea here is that your brain doesn't like inconsistencies and challenges, particularly to his core beliefs, which is very important. Now, the backfire effect is a biological way of protecting this world view. But we have to remember that our world view isn't a perfect house that will live forever. That will live forever? Build, build, build to last forever. Houses are inanimate. Um, world views change over time and they will evolve. Um, so what can we do about this? We can't change it, it's a biological response, but we can be aware of it, and we can use it when thinking about climate change. Um, my advice is to visit people's houses, but don't be a bad guest. Um, so look for agreement and consistency where you can in your communication to people. What facts or stories can you weave in which are consistent with their world narrative, which fits very easily into that house, which isn't confrontational? By all means, try and find gentle challenges to their core beliefs, try to prod a bit, but don't be destructive, don't try to sort of go in for the throat and try to attack their world view and their view of the world because it won't end very well, you'll just get into, a, into an argument and, and you won't actually convince anyone of, of what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> um, and also have a bit of self-reflection as well, try and continually challenge your own 
world view as it will change over time. Now, like I said, we can't be, we can't change our response to these core beliefs, but we can be aware of it. Now, we can see the importance of emotion in communication, especially once again in this post-truth era. The brain can't very easily separate emotional and logic <coughs> here, so we need to think about how we can become better communicators by using some of these ideas. Um, now frames and, and storytelling. It's not what you say, it's how you say it, um, which I think is very important. So frames, um, I consider this as different lenses. Climate change is such an overwhelming and big topic that depending on who you're talking to, you need to approach it in different ways. Understand what entry points are um, and try to speak to people on their own terms. Now, mm -hmm. now a few tips on storytelling. Um, tell stories. Don't bombard people with a lot of facts when you're trying to get them to care about sustainability, climate change, or, or even any other issues. Try and weave a careful number of chosen facts into a broader narrative. Um, talk about lives and livelihoods of people affected. People relate to people, uh, very interesting people, and try to make your story as relevant to the audience which you're talking to. Um, despite how altruistic we might like to think we are, very few people genuinely care about things which are affecting, for example, the other side of the world. Um, you'll get very little <coughs> traction talking about how climate change is a very, very important issue because of floods in Bangladesh rather than talking to someone about um, you know, flooding in Ambleside, for example, if you're trying to change the mind of, of someone, it's try and make it as local as possible. Keep it simple. Um, the Grantham Institute of Climate Change reported that about 83% of people respond better to using simple language, um, which makes it more relatable and easy to understand. Be a trusted voice. Um, sometimes, you might not be the best person to deliver that message. It's sometimes better to come from someone within the community of, of, of who you're talking to. If you're perceived as an <coughs> outsider, there's an already an inherent bias against ideas. Um, this is particularly relevant in more traditional societies or people who hold quite conservative beliefs. So no matter how good you are as a communicator, sometimes you might not be the best person to deliver that <coughs> message. Um, but if you are, um, try and avoid using reassuring phrases. People don't respond very well to phrases like believe me um, and things like that. People feel that there is some sort of hidden um, ulterior motive to communication, interestingly. Um, and mention you can mention your motivations as well to build trust, um, to help build rapport with an individual you're communicating with. You know, why are you trying to convince them <coughs> to care about climate change, to embrace sustainability, for example? You know, if you're talking to your manager um, at work or, or a co-worker, you can talk about how you think this will benefit the business, for example, because a lot of us who communicate climate change don't directly financially or personally benefit really from actually trying to push that message. Um, to talk about motivations is, is quite good a lot of the time. Um, so going back to frames and talking about you know what stories we tell. We can't, climate change is such a big issue, we can't talk about everything. So a few frames, which I <coughs> mentioned here, very, very text-heavy <coughs> slide. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but here are a few different ideas and frames, and I'm more than happy to share this with you afterwards if you are interested in this. But my message here is know your audience, choose your frame. Get to know what your audience cares about. 
and listen to them before you go on this sort of <coughs> campaign trying to get them to care about <coughs> climate change or care about sustainability. Don't try and get your audience to care about climate change. Find out what they already care about and find out how climate change will affect that as that is the most effective way of getting people to care. Now, a few frames here. Um, one of the most common frames which people use when talking about climate change is the scientific one. Um, this logical presentation of facts, how the Industrial Revolution, how technology advancement has led to unprecedented levels of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the Earth is warming, we're seeing negative effects of that warming. We need to do something to tackle it. Very scientific framing of the problem. Another interesting one is the moral framing. Um, this works particularly well with religious communities, tapping into a lot of messages around stewardship and responsibility to take care of the earth. Um, Islamic finance is part of this moral framing to understand how religious views can be tied with this. Health, um, this works very well talking to especially families in cities, um, parents who have young children, <coughs> um, works quite well talking about air quality and, and associated health benefits of tackling climate change. Technology, um, also sort of quite linked with fashion down here, how technology is, is exciting, how renewable energy technology is the future, how climate change is fashionable and <coughs> associated celebrity endorsements, etc. etc. Um, we'll pick a few here. Efficiency and waste, um, talking <coughs> about how saving energy uh, and saving resources is is morally good. Um, how a lot of people have a core value around wastefulness, um, especially older generations who have grown up with ideas of rationing um, and less consumption. Um, the, the waste narrative works particularly well. And, and we go on with risk and opportunity um, and so on and so forth. Um, let me just pick out development as well, because I've had a look at where quite a few people are from um, on, the, on the course um, and I've worked in Nigeria uh, last year and the development narrative is very, very interesting. Sustainability and embracing low carbon technology is seen as inseparable from <coughs> economic growth. The two are one, which is very, very interesting. Um, so you can see how achieving sustainability objectives can actually help achieve uh, development goals as well and that's a very very powerful <coughs> narrative. Um, now in the, in the final part of this lecture before I go to questions I just want to quickly run through um, a bit of storytelling related to that first point which is a scientific story of climate change. I just want to run you through a bit of um, storytelling what I've done um, I gave this lecture out in Hong Kong with the British Council and the Royal Geographical Society um, in March and I just want to take you through it just to give you a few ideas um, about how you might communicate something like the science of climate change. In this lecture I, I took people on this 22,000 year journey, um, 22,000 years ago to the present day. This is chapter one of it. Um, now. This journey, this 22,000 year journey is important because that is from the end of the last ice age and over that time we see how the climate has naturally changed and we can put current man-made warming into a longer narrative um, which is very interesting um, and which people respond to very well I find. So I, I use this quite, can everyone see that? this? this graph at the bottom to help guide people on this story. Um, at the bottom of the graph that represents five degrees colder. At the top of the graph that represents five degrees warmer. Now this line in the middle 
uh, represents the late 20th century average, so the temperature around 1980. So the full temperature graph is benchmarked against that. So we start 22,000 years ago <coughs> at the end of the last ice age, um, around four degrees colder than that average. And we can see the extensive ice cap covering the northern hemisphere around uh, a kilometre thick of ice down to New York and across Europe here. Sea levels about 120 metres lower than they are today. Um, so I'm not going to take you on this entire lecture because that's, a, that's another hour in itself. Um, but what I want to do is more tell you about the techniques which I've used throughout this. Now, I've tried to intersperse what is happening with the climate to what is happening with the story of humanity throughout. Um, so around 21,000 years ago, we have the very first evidence of cave paintings. Um, so we can see early civilization forming um, back to something to do with the climate. Around 20,500 years ago, the ice starts to melt. And then we go into an, a very brief explanation of the science. Um, so we talk about how various orbital factors have caused <coughs> ice ages throughout planetary history. We talk about this and how that, that event 22,000 years ago, that end of the ice age, the warming, was actually caused by a change in the Earth's orbital cycles. And so we continue back on our journey and we mention here um, 15,500 years ago the domestication of dogs to use in, in hunting. Um, and so we go through various chapters and interspersed with science and we get this slow progressive build-up of the temperature graph over this period <coughs> of time. Um, now I found this is a very interesting story to tell because it is as we come into more recognisable parts of history um, Egyptian mummification, for example. Now, I did this lecture in Hong Kong, um, and just to pick up on the example which I mentioned earlier about trying to make it as local as possible, trying to drop in bits of local history and culture into this journey as well is, is very important. Things which people are familiar with or all sort of more sort of uh, satirical, more comedy sort of references just to lighten the mood a bit as well. Um, and so we can see this journey building up over time. The final part, uh, talking about sunspots and volcanic eruptions, which can have an impact on climate change. And then we get to the very recognisable <coughs> part of the story, which is current man-made anthropogenic warming. Um, very quickly going through how this contributes to the greenhouse effect, um, which we're relatively familiar and then we look at, as we approach the end of the graph, we take a moment and we look at this. And we look at this over the context of this 22,000 year journey. <coughs> and we can see that the one degree increase in temperature we've seen since the Industrial Revolution, that one degrees has previously taken us hundreds if not thousands of years to do that same amount of temperature change and importantly all of <coughs> human civilization has developed on the foundations of this extremely extremely stable climate which is very very interesting and, and a very interesting story to tell to put that into context um, and then we bring it forward to the present day <coughs> and finally close it with um, an example of why we should care about climate change, um, <coughs> which is very important to actually take it from a scientific concept and something which is just happening to try and link it back to people's lives. Now, <laughs> I've just talked about the science of climate change. Um, but that isn't actually one of the best ways to convince people to care about it. So sorry for wasting about sort of 12 minutes of your time there. Um, it's interesting and it works with certain people. 
um, for example, people who are already quite curious about climate change and geography concepts and, and this sort of um, audience, but with the general public with much better narratives, some of the frames which I talked about before are much more powerful. Um, and also different mediums work very <coughs> well with different people. Um, I've been primarily talking about sort of conversations today and conversational, um, but you can equally apply what the messages which I've talked about in terms of frames um, to to various other, you know, written media, for example, or how we might communicate through photographs. I was talking to Ashley earlier, who's done a fantastic um, photographic journey of climate change, which is, you know, another way of communicating climate change, um, which is all very, very interesting. Um, so just to round off, um, and I'm quite aware of the time, um, talking about sea level change, uh, just a few more frames to actually round this off. Sea level change is a very powerful one for a lot of people who live in cities. Overwhelming majority of cities around the world for historical region, uh, reasons of trade and defence um, are built on coastal areas or near rivers. Sea level rise is very important and will affect these communities. Talking about the links with the Sustainable Development Goals, um, looking at how tackling climate change can actually improve quality of life rather than reduce standard of living. You know, it's not about efficiency. Um, it's not about efficiency and, and, and giving up certain things. It's about doing more with less <coughs> and actually trying to improve quality of life. Um, we can talk about finance. We can talk about ideas of stranded assets, risk and opportunity, as we discussed before. Um, food prices, for example, is a very relatable one. Everyone eats, everyone buys food. Um, <coughs> talking about how climate change will affect food. Um, and we started with him, so we'll finish with him. Um, there are also certain frames which would work with people of a more conservative leaning, ideas of energy security, which appeals to the core beliefs and values of nationalism and sovereignty um, which is very powerful so thing you know you can fit certain narratives into people um, and for example you know you, you could have a very interesting conversation about climate change with you know a very strong Republican for example without <coughs> actually mentioning what they see as sort of more controversial climate science but by talking about issues which are related such as access to energy. You know, you can talk about energy security, <coughs> as I mentioned. We can talk about um, subsidies and how, um, you know, solar and wind are out-competing fossil fuels and how fossil fuels have been <coughs> subsidised for a number of years um, and things like this. So my, my slightly waffly um, idea here is that we don't need to talk to people about the ideas which, ve which conflict with their worldview. We can find ways of talking about climate change and sustainability and getting people to where we want to be without um, confrontation. Um, so just to wrap up with uh, a few key messages and then I'm very happy to ask questions if you answer questions. If you have any, I might ask you some as well. Um, so why should we communicate with people who we don't believe, who don't share our current worldview. Um, remember the importance of getting that momentum forward to make sure <coughs> what we're seeing at the moment, this great start of the sustainability journey, takes off and takes off very <coughs> fast because with climate change we don't have that much time to get this right so we need to get more people involved in that and the losers of globalisation I, I see as an important people to engage with. How can thinking about core beliefs and storytelling <coughs> help me? Consider core values. Um, I know that there's been an awful lot of content tonight. Um, and I, I, I tried to cut some out of my presentation, focus on a few things, but I wanted to share <coughs> a little bit of everything with you. So I hope that you 
leave this room and reflect on some of the ideas which I mentioned and my contact details are at the end and if you do want any sort of further reading um, associated with some of the concepts that I've mentioned please I'm more than happy to, to share um, them with you. Um, so consider core values, think about some of the storytelling ideas and know your audience and choose your frame accordingly. Um, I'll just end on what I think is the most important message to take away from this <coughs> is when trying to get people to care about climate change, don't try and make them care about climate change. Find out what we already care about and find out how climate change will affect that as your job will be a whole lot easier. Um, and on that note, I thank you very much for listening to me. Um, an hour and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have so thank you very much. Thank you.